Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer. I'm a serial entrepreneur and a consultant with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Please allow me to introduce you to Ted Fleming. Ted, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here, Mark. Ted has written a great book called uh, Develop, Seven Practical Tools to Take Charge of Your Career. He speaks frequently on topics including managing your career, executive presence, driving business results, leadership, creativity, and innovation. Ted has a bachelor's degree in economics from Dartmouth and an MBA from the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. Does that make you a, a big Duke basketball fan? I'm a big Duke basketball fan, and you haven't lived till you've uh, been in Cameron Indoor with everyone just packed in there. Hopefully and, and, after COVID. <laughs> and who was the star when you were there? When I was there was Grant uh, Hill was the big star and Bobby Hurley. Oh, you're aging yourself now by even saying that because Grant Hill played yes, 20 I years am. in the NBA. Yeah. And that's a long time ago. <laughs> it is, but it was a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah. Well, they won with three championships. Yes, they won a couple while uh, I was there. Yes. Oh, that's sweet. Really, really nice. So Grant, tell us a little bit about your background. So um, my background has been a little mixed. I started out as a long-term uh, substitute teacher. Uh, then after that, I wanted to get some, always knew I wanted was interested in business. So I spent 20 years in Boston, first as a banker. Then after uh, that, got into healthcare, uh, had my own consulting business, and then now uh, for the past 15 years, been back into uh, healthcare and now with CVS. Yeah. So what, what made you write this book? So what made me write this book, uh, and this is a great way to do it, people kept asking me, when are you gonna write a book? And the reason I said, well, why? And they said, well, the advice that you have given me is different than the advice that I've been getting. Uh, they found it very clear uh, also, being in HR, I saw firsthand the frustration people felt when they were trying to find their right career. So that was really the main driver for writing the book, helping people uh, navigate their career better. Well, I found it really interesting, especially because so many people, especially a lot of the people who are on today, are thinking mm -hmm. about how do they reinvent themselves? And, you know, I know I've reinvented myself. I started out as a career sports writer and I've had a, a bunch of different careers from entrepreneur to academic to podcaster. And I find that life every day is, can be really interesting if you're opening yourself up to uh, possibilities. So why did you change careers and companies so often? And what did your parents say? <laughs> uh well, like a, a lot of parents, they just wanted to make sure I had health care, right? So uh -huh. I was covered. Uh, I changed careers. And, and I, when I'm speaking with clients, I talk about two basic career uh, paths. One is sort of the traditional. I start as a junior person and move my way up the ladder. And many people's careers are like that. But my career was different. And when you move industries, move organizations, what I found is I was good at certain things and then I applied those skills in different situations. So for me personally, I found that I love solving problems and doing turnarounds and I love starting things that are new, similar probably to you as an entrepreneur. By the way, you've got this great voice. Uh, so, uh, you know, you should probably have your own uh, podcast if you don't have one already, because you have a nice voice just to listen to. Uh, um, thank you. Why don't the vast majority of people reach their potential in your mind? I think it's a combination of reasons, but what I have found is that people don't do enough exploration, number one. Number two, they don't have sufficient mentors and sponsors so that they can guide you. And I say those are the two biggest reasons people don't reach their full, full potential. Do, do people tend to limit themselves? 
They do. I, I they quickly. I'm amazed, which is why one of the tools is the job exploration summary. You know, just because you start in retail or just because you start in manufacturing, people quickly narrow their focus to just that one industry or just that one company. And I spend a lot of time expanding people's uh, lens. I think a lot of people also, once they have kids, they think I can't take any risks now. And so I'm locked into whatever that is. And I'll have to just wait till the kids are off to college or out of college. Well, I think, yes. And I think it could be easier. Sometimes it's easier to be in the same industry, the same company, the same role. Uh, I, and I'm not denying that. It takes a lot of work to change and switch. But I think I've been able to convince people over the years that for many people, it's worth it. It's worth the investment in time. Um, how is COVID affecting people's career choices and options? Yeah, this is a difficult time. Uh, number one, it's narrowing a lot of options, right? Whenever there is general anxiety, people tend to, um, what we see is people want to be with family, right? They want to be with the ones they love. Uh, they want to be with people that they already know. And so how that translates in a business setting is people are just hiring people that they know very well, or they're hiring in a very narrow band. So that's what makes it uh, difficult. But again, networking in this case is, is the key. Yeah, please talk about the seven tools you write about because I thought they were pretty interesting. Yeah, so the, the way I arrange the book and the seven tools, there's four, at a high level, four of the tools are about exploring your options and finding that job. So. In order to do that, it's can I, I have a tool to broaden your perspective. I have a tool so that you can ask the right questions of employers. I have a tool about mapping your experience and how you can translate your experience. And then I have a tool on networking. And so that is part one. And then part two is once you have a role, how can you continue to develop and those um, three of those tools are around um, leadership, what's your leadership style, what are your spheres of influence, and how do you create a development plan that works? And do you, do you suggest to people that they write out a plan for themselves? I do. I think there's a lot of power in just writing down your aspirations. And so I always, run through that exercise with people uh, because otherwise what you get is you get something that's unclear and then when you're working with mentors and sponsors they can help refine your language over time which should help you i myself like to write everything out so i appreciate that yeah. oh definitely I, I always thought of HR, uh, which you're part of, should be a nurturing part of any organization, figure out how to maximize potential. How does your organization help people maximize their potential? Well, I think when what most organizations do, certainly this occurs in, in most large organizations, they have formal development programs. They look for high potential people and they put them in leadership development programs. But in addition, most organizations also provide career development where you can take an hour long program or a seminar or have access to resources. So that tends to work for larger organizations. The beauty of today's technology is if you don't happen to work for one of those organizations, you can go on YouTube and you can go on wonderful podcasts like Mark's and get a uh, a whole host of information that will allow you to navigate your career. What, what programs are most popular with employees that they take up? What we find is number one is how can they better communicate their needs? So whether it's executive presence or how to giving better presentations. So there's a lot about communication. And then the other things that people value are just hearing about people's career paths. 
everyone's career path will be individual, but it helps if you at least have a blueprint or a roadmap to say, okay, that's been done before, so maybe I can do it. Uh, and, and does your company, uh, how did you get your mentors? Did you seek them out or what did you do? Yes, you should uh, seek out mentors. And what I tell people is you should have a couple of types of mentors. Number one is a mentor that has the exact same strength that you have, only they perform it at a much higher level. And by doing that, you will have a natural affinity and camaraderie, and they can tell you how your skills will translate in the future. The second type of mentor is someone that can help you overcome or develop a new area of expertise. And that's what I was thinking would be the first one, because like having somebody who uh, does the opposite of you because you want to develop that, I thought that would probably be the case. Yeah, a lot of people think that, but you know, maybe our Western society, we love to focus on the negative, but often you're much better off finding someone who has the same strength as you are. They can give you some possibilities, some new ways to apply that strength. And then one caveat I'll say is when you're looking for people to help you with areas that you're weak, you want to find people that have overcome the same weakness, not necessarily someone who's always been strong in that area. Well, what kind of mentor should you avoid? Because some people think they'd be good mentors, but they're really not. Yeah, well, the, the short answer is you can learn from everyone. Uh -huh. And so even if you have some folks that want to mentor you or reach out, and let's say they're terrible examples of uh, leadership or they don't have the same uh, skills or philosophy or approach or values that you have. You can still learn from them. You just learn what not to do. Uh, but uh, you want to avoid people that are just in it for themselves. You want to have a good two-way communication and you're learning from each other. That's what you want. Uh, how much time should you expect from a mentor if you get one? What's reasonable? I would say, and this is true of most uh, mentoring sort of formal programs, you can count on an hour a month. And like any relationship, if you click, you'll meet a lot more often. If you don't click or it's very formal, then you might meet a little less. But I certainly, when you're thinking about mentoring, you'd want to touch base with that person at least three or four times a year. So a lot of people hire executive coaches. And, and, there are, and I remember years, you know, years ago that people were getting certified as an executive coach. And I thought, I, I would never get, me personally, I only want people of line experience and have been there, done that. So. When you're looking, uh, and a lot of people here who are listening are all executives and they still feel like, oh, I could use a coach. How do you, uh, what's the profile of the ideal executive coach and how do you evaluate whether they're the right person for you and can give you what you need? What, what, and what are some of the questions you should ask? Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, there are different types. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the main categories. There are a pool of executive coaches that stem from sort of organizational behavior psychology. All right. And so if you choose to use some of, if you choose to use that type of executive coach, it's because they're very good on the soft skills they're very good on the art and they will probe into your personality and try to uncover what are the few changes that if you make them will make you more successful. Then Mark, as you said, there are a whole bunch of other folks. I, to differentiate them from executive coaches, I call them business advisors. And so a business advisor is someone that's been there and done that. And so when you're working with a business advisor, they're going to show you and share with you, here's how I became successful. Here's some strategies for you to become successful. 
And now we have a whole host of folks that are now uh, life coaches and oh. they look at your total well-being and they look for ways to integrate the various facets of your life. So it just depends on what, what you want. And these days uh, you, you can find it. How do you make sure that you're really good at, at uh, absorbing this coaching and being coachable? Because some people are just not coachable. And they yeah, think they still want that coaching. They, they, they think that they, they want the coaching. Yes. Uh, one of the things we, uh, we tell uh, clients all the time and I tell managers is if you want to hire a coach because you think I'm going to fix that person, it's not going to work. Uh, you have to be open to coaching. You have to, uh, you have to want it. And you have to have a pretty strong idea of what it is you're trying to correct. Again, I encourage you to focus either on a strength or one or two areas of improvement. And I mean that, just uh, two or three things. That's it. You write about in your book, uh, you, uh, you talk about... Um, the feel, feeling journal. What is the feeling journal and how do you use that? Uh, the, the feeling journal. That's back when uh, I was a banker and I was in some mastermind groups. Uh, the feeling journal was every day at the end of the day, on a scale of one to 10, I would rate the day. One, would, one meaning it was a terrible day, 10 meaning it was a fantastic day. And next to that, I had to write down why I felt that way. And then after about, I don't know, three or four months, we got together as a group and we say, how did you feel that day? <laughs> I was like, this was a terrible day. And then I, we would go to a day that was a great day. And I'd say, well, why was that a great day? Well, I sold that, you know, I sold that uh, piece of business. And they're like, well, didn't you notice that you wouldn't have sold that piece of business when you said you were a 10 if you didn't have all these meetings that you rated were a two? And so what you learn from that is basically stop worrying so much. You can only control your, your behavior and actions and uh, don't go on the roller coaster ride of feelings. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a good, good recommendation for life because people get um, too emotional about it and need to take a step back and, uh, and uh, uh, objectively look at whatever's happening to them at that particular time. Right. It's hard to do, but it, it is helpful. Um, how many times do you need to do something before you call yourself an expert? Because you talk about that in the book, that people write in the resumes, they're an expert and whatever. And all of a sudden you find out they're like James Bond. They have so many <laughs> different expertise. <laughs> all right. I have a couple of answers to these questions. Uh, one is we'll take the situation where you're being interviewed. Okay. If you're being interviewed for a position, I will say you're an expert if you can tell me three stories that support whatever that area of expertise is. So if you're telling me you're a top salesperson, show me by telling me three different stories of when you excelled as a salesperson. That's one way. If you're trying to develop your own mastery or expertise, it's a, it isn't just time, but it's also situational, right? So in order to master something or be an expert, you have to do it across a few different scenarios and conditions. You know, you know, Mark is an entrepreneur. Okay, great. Are you an entrepreneur when the economy is great? Or are you also good at, at uh, creating a business when it's in a tough economic environment? If so, then you're probably a good serial entrepreneur. Yeah, I, and I think that's a great thing because that's all I remember back before the last, uh, well, the recession too. Uh, 1999, people had these IT companies and they were just blowing it out. And they were thinking of themselves as entrepreneurs until the economy went south and they started, you know, all their clients started cutting up their contracts and then they didn't know how to react uh, to that. And those who survived that, they were true entrepreneurs because they managed to roll with the punches uh, to keep themselves going. And that, that's gotta be very critical. Right. Is, is there a formula for mastering something? A formula for mastering something. Um, I think 
people like Angela Duckworth when she talks about uh, grit at the University of Pennsylvania. They, I love done, her book. Yeah, she's done extensive research on this, and and what you what we know you need is you need uh, some deliberate. Uh, deliberate, sorry, deliberate practice. You need to do it over time in different situations. And you need good coaches and mentors that can show you how. Uh, you can fumble around a long time by yourself, uh, but you're learning incrementally and via mistakes. Uh, you look at any, and we've learned this from looking at athletes. We've learned this from looking at entrepreneurs and we've learned this from looking at artists at all levels, they have intense coaching so that they can master their skill. And you know, there's no shortcut. I mean, I, I love uh, when I, I took my oldest daughter who's watching this podcast to see a documentary on Michael Jordan when she in the 90s, mm -hmm. and he used to shoot 500 balls a day. And he would tell the team, he would tell his teammates, even after Phil Jackson finished practice, I feel like I still need to work. And he's the best player in the world. And, you know, if you, uh, any of these great athletes, or I read Kevin Hart's book about being a comedian, and people thought he was an overnight success, but he studied like getting a, a you know, a doctorate in comedy. You know, the amount of time he put in studying lines and, and how you put together jokes and watching other comedians and getting coached by other comedians you know, there's no shortcut to being an expert. Right, and I'm sure a, a lot of your followers have, you know, have read the Gladwell book on uh, outliers and the 10,000 hours theory. But, you know, that does come from a lot of research uh, in, I believe it was violinists. And they said that the only difference, as long as you have a, a you have to have a minimal amount of talent, uh, but after that, the only thing that differentiated the good from the great was hard work and the amount of hours they practiced. That was it. Yeah, and, 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 and so the psychology, right? Where do we always hear in pro sports is at that level, it's mostly what's in between your ears, mm -hmm. right? They, everybody has that capability at that level. But if, unless you really push yourself and keep trying to get better all the time, it's just not going to happen. That's right. Uh, please talk about uh, the must-have job factors. You talk about that in your book. Uh, the must-have, yes. Uh, this is when I when I talk to people, I say that motivation and happiness really have two independent scales. One is what are your must-have factors. And that means if a job or position doesn't have these factors, you're not going to be happy. And then I contrast that with the motivating factors, which are what makes you truly happy. And so that's why people can love their job and hate their job at the same time. You can love what you do every day, but if it doesn't pay the bills, you're not happy. And so it's important to focus on those must have factors so that you know what are the minimum requirements. And we know for those that know negotiation, you know, that's kind of your bat now, right? That's what, that's your walk away. If, I, if the role doesn't have this, it's not worth having that job. Yeah, use yourself as an example. What did, you know, this current job you're in now, what, what did it have to have for you to have taken it? Well, as I told you uh, before, I learned pretty early in life that I love solving problems and starting things and I loved sort of fixing things. So I looked for a job that gave me some autonomy. I had some resources to try something new and I had the support of my leadership to try new things. And so those are the things that I need. And if I don't have those, I, I don't want it. I uh, understood. Uh from, con from your consulting work, do you think leaders get, uh, get that money really doesn't buy happiness and what should leaders focus on for motivating people? Because I hear that all, often uh, from people that I rather make less and like the organization that I'm in or what I'm doing. And I've seen it myself from running organizations that people would stay with me just because they like the job. 
Right. No, I think that's a that's a great point, Mark. I think we know it intellectually, but there in a lot of organizations, some of the few tools that they have are money. So that's what they give. So I think leaders do understand it intellectually, but what it takes is it takes extra effort to reach out and get to know you as a person to find out what motivates you. Uh, and there are people that are motivated by money. There are people that are motivated by a title. I know people that I could cut their salary by $10,000 if I gave them a title because that's, that's what they value. Their self-image. Yes, yeah, exactly. And for other people, they are smaller things. You know, give me some flexibility. I want to go see my kids' baseball games or I want to uh, invest in my education uh, and I'd like you to support that. So yeah, it's very individual. Uh, how, do, how do you maintain a high level of motivation? Well, one is to recognize that you can't motivate people. That's, that's you motivate yourself. What I guide managers to do is say, are you creating the environment that allows people to get in touch with what motivates them. And more likely than not, are you removing the barriers that get in the way? That's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, you're right about, is there an organization outside your own that really gets it, especially the 12, 25 motivating factors you list? I was blown away about the 12, 25 motivating factors. Right. And it, I use that as a, as a guide. What I find is that's just a starter. And I try to get people to identify, say their top three to five. And I don't think that an organization gets them all right. But what I do think is everyone can find a manager, a role, uh, you know, a department that will meet all of the things that you are interested in and what motivates you. But very often, it's not the entire organization. You're looking at your little microcosm. So I'm wondering, a lot of people who are listening to this are entrepreneurs, running entrepreneurial companies. What are the few things that you think they should focus on to motivate employees, both to attract them and retain them? Well, I love uh, Simon Sinek. I don't, I'm sure folks are aware of that particularly when you're an entrepreneur and, and you're starting off, I tell people, what's your why? You know, why, why are you doing this? What, what is your motivation? What problems are you trying to solve? That's what people need to fall in love with because then you, that motivation and that value and purpose will allow them to play multiple roles uh, for you. So that, that's what I'd, I'd say there. Other than that, it's just good leadership. If you are a good leader, you know, you know people will follow you. Yeah, so a good foosball uh, machine and free <laughs> snacks isn't going to do that? No, no. And it's, it's funny. Those are nice things. But actually, uh, I've taken people uh, on what we call immersion uh, site visits where we visit places like Google, Apple, you know, all sorts of home shopping network. And I'll tell you, when I talk to those people, Cambridge Innovation Center, uh, what is most effective are w areas, whatever you do, and often it's food and or drink, but it's whatever actually allows people to come together and network and share their ideas with people they don't interact with on a day-to-day -day base, basis. That's what, that's what really drives it. So unfortunately, it's not the foosball table, but don't remove them because they're still, <laughs> they're still fun. <laughs> you must be an expert now in foosball. <laughs> I, I, I have to say that money, I don't think is a motivator and you didn't even mention it. Now I once was CEO of a, a company that um, my board asked me to take over. I was actually on the board of this company and then they asked me to take it over. And I so disliked running this company that every day I would pray that the train would derail taking me to this, uh, to this office. I really did. I was like praying the train would derail so I wouldn't have to go in. And I kept trying to think of ways that I could 
speed up the process that it would be fixed so I could get out because I didn't like the people I was even around on a daily basis. Right. Now, I will say, since you, you brought it up, uh, what money, what most employees look to is, pardon me, is they look to money as fairness. Okay. People want equity and they want fairness when it comes to money. So it, it, money isn't a great motivator, but if you don't get that part right and people don't feel like they're being paid fairly or equitably across all the employees, that's where you run into trouble. But as long as you get there after that, it's not about money at all. Considering what we're going through right now, is there any advantage to a startup besides being able to pivot quickly to take advantage of market opportunities? Yeah, I think, uh, now let, let me clarify. Now you're talking about like a small startup trying yeah. to get in yeah. during this environment. Yeah. Yeah, what, what I say is you've got to solve a problem for someone. In other words, we talked before about uh, COVID and people being anxious. Uh, and people really closing in on their circle. So that means, conversely, that they're not letting a lot of new people in. They're not as open to try new things. So in order to break that, you've got to solve a problem for someone. And so whenever I'm working with entrepreneurs, I say, tell me where your first five customers are coming from and tell me what problem you're solving. And until you do that, you don't have a business. Come back to me after you get your first five clients and then we'll talk. And, and, and which is sound advice. And a, a lot of people listening are thinking about going into consulting. And what should they be thinking about when consulting? This is an avocation, uh, is an avocation. What's the biggest misunderstanding about going into consulting? So what should they think about it? And what's the biggest misunderstanding? Right. Uh, one thing that I find is many people don't realize that to be a successful consultant, you have to really have that expertise. So what are you, you know, what are you, what are you selling to the, to the world? What problems are you solving? So that's one thing. The second thing is I know a lot of people that go into consulting because they say, Ted, I'm going to be a consultant because I have all this knowledge and I'll be in charge of my schedule and you know, I have control over my life. I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> you will not. And so I think the biggest surprise people have is uh, number one, they're not in charge of their daily uh, life. And number two, whatever you, you have to discover what people want to hire you for. So when I was a consultant uh, and had my own business, I thought I was gonna teach everyone about leadership. And then when I got into it, people did not care about uh, leadership. They didn't wanna hear that from me. What they wanted to learn from me was revenue generation. And they wanted to learn a little bit about diversity from me. And they wanted to learn about innovation. And I was like, but that's not what I wanted to do. I, I wanna have this big leadership practice. So that's the other big aha people have is you're a consultant. What is it that people want from you and listen to the market? Yeah, you know, I do a lot of marketing uh, strategy and development and implementation. But at the end of the day, people just say, so what kind of business development you're going to do for me? You know, right. more like sales, you know, help me. And so I would introduce make 10 introductions a week for my clients. And so, cause I knew they wanted that. The other thing I think people forget when they're starting consulting is you have to overbook yourself because clients are coming and going and somebody who says that they're on for a year, all of a sudden drops it after three months. And even if you have a contract, you're not gonna go sue these people. This contract would have to be substantial uh, for you to go and do that. So I think a lot of people underestimate, like you said, the time is no longer your own. Cause like as a consultant, uh, and as my daughter's founder for doing it the last nine years and friends of mine, you, there's no number of hours in a day <laughs> that you could stop working. Unlike when you work for someone and you actually have vacation, even when you're on vacation, it's hard to disconnect because right. <laughs> the client's expecting more. Right. Exactly. And they pay you to learn at these big companies, which is great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's always super. Someone's asked, when you're in an early stage company, how do you find and hire the top talent? 
When you're in an early stage company, uh, what I would say is some basic rules of thumb, interview at least three people, interview them at least three different times in three different settings. Uh, so that's one thing. And then you want to look when you're very first starting out, you want people that are in love with your purpose and are passionate about what, what you want to do. Uh, because you want them to wear multiple hats and you want them to usually do it at uh, a discount <laughs> right. until you're able to grow the business. And so that's what you're looking for. Uh, how does a person mid and late career pivot to another industry? Yeah, I talk about that under the special circumstances. There we're talking about transition. And I equate it to learning a new language, right? So learning a, a language that's foreign to you. Uh, number one, you need some professors or formal training in this new industry. You know, what's, what's this industry about? How does it make money? You need lots of technical knowledge. Number two, you need to learn to speak the lingo of the new industry. So in order to pivot, can you speak for a half hour using the lingo that's used in that industry? So you need a coach to do that. Uh, and then finally, can you immerse yourself by turning on the television, reading a business journal, reading whatever is related to that industry? Can you read an article or speak with someone and understand what they're saying? And once you're able to use that language, people will know that you're part of the in crowd, right? And so I spend a lot of time on that. You know, Mark, you could ask me two or three questions right now and you would know by my answer, you know, Ted doesn't know anything about podcasts, right? right? So the idea is you've got to learn that new language so people will see you as an insider. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you got for your career? That I got? Yeah. Uh, that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, there's an, And to try different things until you figure out what you're good at. Yes. Huh. That sounds like raising kids. That's a right. marathon, <laughs> not a sprint. That's right. Uh, the, the last time I applied for a job, President Reagan was uh, the president of the United States and applying uh, to ads was often considered a waste if you didn't know someone. Is that still true of jobs outside of IT and engineering where there's always this high demand? Yeah, what I tell people is it doesn't hurt, you know? It, it doesn't hurt to answer ads what, what, I, what I worry about people is when they think that applying online for 50 jobs is a job search. It's, it's not. It's a leg in a job search. So yes, you can go ahead and apply. I also remind people that you still want to use networking because just think about it. If you see a job in a newspaper or on an industry board, what they're saying is, we couldn't find someone internally that wanted this job. Or there's something wrong with this job and the last few folks didn't make it. So we're trying to reach out to some strangers to come in and take this job. So you wanna be careful. But isn't there you know, some uh, companies that put that out there because they need to interview a diverse number of candidates and you're worried, uh, especially if you're a minority, that that's out there, but they're really not going to give you the job. You know, you didn't really know somebody in there. What, what's your response to that? Well, I think especially as people are getting more comfortable with social media and with the tools related to it, it's getting better. So I would say, you know, if you use LinkedIn and you have a strong profile, uh, people look at that. And you are actually seeing, I am actually seeing people a lot more successful using uh, LinkedIn and other sorts of social media, even Facebook. Uh, so I think it is uh, changing, but it doesn't beat that networking like you're saying, uh, Mark. And it doesn't mean some organizations will put out uh, a job just to see what type of talent they get. 
right? So they're, they're doing it, they're using it as an exploratory tool. Oh, of course. Uh, and I, I think the networking is, is key. And it, how, how do you network now when the only thing you can do is essentially Zoom people? Well, one, that's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's, it's okay to Zoom people. Uh, and it might take a few more interactions. Um, but I spend a lot of time in the book on networking because I find most people are afraid of it and they do it incorrectly or not as effectively. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to talk to peers, you want to talk to clients and people that know you well, and you want to use your social connections uh, to network effectively. And then use all of those segments, your social, your peer, and your clients to connect you to people you don't know at all, traditional networking, and to connect you uh, so that you can get the opportunity you're looking for. So you said that there's bad ways of networking. Um, yeah. What's the incorrect ways in your mind of networking? Well, what I, what I do in, when I give workshops, it's, uh, it's funnier in the workshop, but the idea <laughs> is for a lot of people, networking was you know a, a, a drink or glass in one hand right? They've got a plate of food in another hand, and they're like this, talking to someone, oh, yeah, to a stranger, I don't know you, you don't know me, and at the end of the day, I'm going to give you uh, a business card or my LinkedIn connection, and then think that's going to result in something. That's bad networking. Uh, also, calling people up uh, and on the very first time saying, well, I'm looking for a job or I'm looking for this new opportunity or I'm looking for an angel investor for this amount of money. It just doesn't work that way. There's four conditions. People have to know you, they have to like you, they have to know your work and they have to like your work. And when you meet those four conditions, now you're networking effectively and now you're working on it. I, I find the first book I wrote was uh, Power Networking. And mm -hmm. for me, what works is go into a room, meet as many people as I can, get as many cards as I can, and then set up times to actually get to know the people. And the first thing I always ask everybody is, what can I do for them? And I literally go and try to do that for them. And then maybe at some point, I don't expect it, maybe at some point they can be helpful to me in some way. But I kind of feel that that's what works for me. Now, there are people who advocate get to know three people really well at an event. Mm -hmm. But my feeling for me is, is there might've been 12 people I missed by just focusing on those three that could have been even better contacts. And I can go and contact those same people and arrange a time if it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, Mark, what I find is a lot of your the approaches to network have to do with personality. Right. So I personally am much more introverted. So I'm much more, I'm going to talk to the three people. Other folks are going to meet 25 people, 30 people, and then they'll follow up. But you, you it, to answer your question, in this environment, use your social, Facebook, LinkedIn. And as Mark is saying, you know, you would stand the olive branch. You say, I read this, I think this might help you. Or maybe I can connect someone in my network for what you're looking for. And just be interested in what they're doing. You know, that, that's an old, old saying in sales. You want to be interesting, be interested. And just be interested in people, find out what they're trying to do. And we're just talking about, you know, we're social creatures. We're just trying to build that relationship. You know, I, I think being authentic is really important. Yeah. And because a lot of people, you know, I get people who contact me to network and they're really only interested in what I could do for them. But I mean, like they're not really truly interested in that or people send you people and they're like, well, why did you send me this person except to waste my time because I don't see the quid pro quo here. You know, like, what am I getting? I get what they're going to get out of it, but I don't get why you sent them to me. Right. And when, whenever I connect people via email, I make a point of saying, you know, you know Michael, here's Joseph, or here's Barbara. And uh, Michael, here's, here's why I'm connecting you to Barbara. 
here's a little bit about her background. Here's what she's interested in. Barbara, here's Michael. Here's why I think you would be a good connection. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help uh, and then go from there. And I've had uh, numerous people say that made it so much easier because it gave us a starting point. Oh, no question. Um, what questions shouldn't uh, you ask an interview at the first meeting? You talk about this in the book. <laughs> don't ask for a date. Uh, <laughs> don't ask, don't ask for, don't talk about uh, salary. But what, you know, here's what you should ask. What you should ask is you should ask about the specific role or opportunity. What you shouldn't do is try to impress people. This is the downside of, of social media and the internet. What you shouldn't ask is to try to impress people. I've had people ask me about my iPod. What's Yeah, talk iPod. about that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So I had someone come in to set the scene and uh, we're sitting down having an interview. Her first question to me was, you know, what do you, how do you think the Affordable Care Act is going to uh, affect your business? So I was like, oh, oh, okay, that's a pretty deep question. So I answered the question. Then they says, well, do you have, uh, I hear music playing in the background. I said, yes. She says, where's it coming from? So I show her. She says, may I see your uh, iPod? I said, sure. And she starts scrolling through and she asked a number of other questions. She asked me questions about my, uh, my president. She asked me questions about my chairman. She asked questions about the board. So what type of role do you think this person was applying for? You know, head of strategy, something like that? Yeah, I thought you were a C-level. Yeah. yeah, this person was applying to be a temp uh, assistant. <laughs> and so- Are you sure they she, weren't trying to <laughs> execute a, cue, a coup of your company? <laughs> That's right. And so I'm like, you know, just because you have access to all this information, you're not impressing anyone. You impress people by saying, what's the role like? What are my day to day responsibilities? Here's my experience in the past. And here's how I can help you. That's what people want. So again, going back to your earlier com comments, Mark, it's about being authentic. If you come across authentic, genuine and you're upfront with people, you'll make the right connections. What is the job expiration summary that you write about and how does that work? Yeah, so that's the first tool and that's what we we're talking about, you know, expanding people's uh, thoughts and horizons. So I no longer, I never ask people, what is it you want to do? I say, I ask, what are you willing to explore? And so I say, I want you to identify three different industries that you're willing to explore. And then when they do that, I say, I want you to identify three companies for each industry. And then I want you to identify three roles. And if people do that, I tell them you just come up with 21 different jobs. And what you do, you do that by coming up with role industry company. So that's, I'm interested in exploring a marketing role, say in the entertainment industry for a company like Disney. And just that short sentence is clearer than 80% of the people I ever speak with that are looking for opportunities. Being specific about what you're looking for. Right, and you can have multiple ones. That's why I say explore. People, I can't tell you how many people keep rewriting the top portion or the objective of their resume because they're applying for different jobs. Oh, this is a marketing job, so I'm gonna rewrite that. Oh, oh, wait, this is a sales job. I was like, no, just stop, stop doing that. Uh, and what's real important about the job exploration summary are the companies. I ask people, what are companies that you admire? And why that's important is culture is extremely important. You're looking for that fit. And so we can't often explain that, but we can explain a company that we like or that we admire. And that will sum up for people visually the type of environment you want to work in. That was my next question, by the way. So thank you for answering that. Asking oh. that asked an answer. <laughs> that's right. So um, 
Before going to an interview, what is the best formula for preparation? And that's my English bulldog. So I'm going to put this on oh, you to answer. All right. So the best formula for me is I tell people to use the old star method, which is the situation, task, action, and results. And no matter what uh, question people ask you, what they really want is they want you to complete that loop. So most people use behavioral interviewing because that's the technique. And so if we say, tell me about a time when you did X, they're asking you the situation. So you tell them, then you tell them what the task is, then you tell them the actions you took, and then the results. Or they might say, tell me a time when you uh, achieved a great, you know, what's your greatest accomplishments? They want you to start with the results. So then you tell them what the situation was and the task and the actions you took, and then you go back to the results. So that's what I do. And then you heard me say before, if you can tell three stories related to a particular area or skill, you're ready for the interview. When you're looking to hire someone, how should the questions be asked? Like sometimes I've gone into interviews uh, and they are almost asking yes or no questions. Cause and I'm thinking, well, they really don't know a lot about interviewing. So how, uh, as an interviewer, should you ask the question so you get the, the most amount of information or the kind of information you're looking for? Mm -hmm. As an interviewer, what you want to do, and that's actually the second part of the job exploration summary, which is what's the employer view? So if you're the one during the hiring, what's the first question you want to answer is, does the person have direct experience doing whatever it is I want them to do? And then the answer to that question is, yes, they do, or no, they don't. If the answer is yes, then tell me about it. T give me examples. If the answer is no, then I go down to the next level, which is, do you have the knowledge and skills in order to do this job well? And the answer to that is yes or no. If yes, you do have it, then I want you to tell me about the skills you do have and give me examples of how you've used them. And then if you don't have either of those things, then the last thing on the rung is, do you have the education so that if I take a chance on you, you're gonna learn quickly and do a good job. So if I'm looking at it from the employer's perspective, that's what you're probing for. I'm just curious, what's your success record? What's your batting average of going through the interviews, offering the people the jobs and, and they actually stuck a year or more? That's a good question. I would say on my little team, I do pretty well. I'd say 70, 80%. I'd say when you look at uh, a lot of the research, it's once you get to the executive level, especially if you hire someone from externally, it's like a 50-50 that they're there after three to five years. Um, so that, again, underscores the importance of culture. That's the other thing you want to probe for is, do you like the person? Do you see them working next to you? Do you see them interacting with your team? Or are they going to be emotionally expensive? And you don't want emotionally expensive employees. Yeah, I can imagine that. But what, what do you have to show in order for you to take a chance on someone? What do they have to show? I, I think, and again, I go back to Angela Duckworth. I think in, earlier in career, they have to show grit. They have to show persistence. They have to show that they're willing to work hard and they're willing to listen. I think that's what they need. Uh, because in order to take a chance, I'm saying, I'm going to teach you the skills. Are you, are you open to learn and are you going to work hard? At the higher levels, do they have cultural fluency? Are you smart enough to recognize that where you're working today is different from where you were? And are you able to adapt? Are you flexible? Are you agile, right? You've heard all those buzzwords, but that's yeah. basically bottom line. What they mean is, do you have that cultural fluency to know, here's how to get things done in this organization. I can do that. Is, is getting an MBA still valued? In the, and is there a value if it doesn't come from a top 10 or even 25 school? I mean, you went to Duke, it's a top 10 school. I taught at Wharton 
And you know, those schools, they're magnets for people coming to them. But then you look at our schools and you think to yourself, well, you know, and they're all being taught the same because I've taught a lot of different schools. Right. They're all being taught the same, but the value is not perceived to be the same by employers. So what do you think about that? Yeah. Uh, thanks. That's a doozy of a question. So I'll tell you how I, I parse <laughs> it out and, and uh, just stick with me for a little bit. It's situational. So here's what I say. You're buying a network. And, and Mark is absolutely right. The core skills that you're going to learn in an MBA program are the same across any really good program. So what are you buying? You're buying a network, you're buying uh, professors or a particular approach. So here's what I tell people. Again, just like I tell people, you know, I don't ask people what job they want. I ask them what they're willing to explore. When it comes to an MBA, I ask them, what's your situation? If you're gonna go full time and you're gonna pay for it yourself and you want the maximum amount of flexib flexibility and opportunity, go to a top 10 to 25 school. That's what you should do. If you're gonna go full time and you're gonna pay for yourself or you're gonna go part time and you're paying for it yourself, then what I recommend is pick an area or a geography that you know you wanna live in and you wanna to go to the school that has that best network, right? So there are a lot of great schools in your area where the employers value that education. You're, you're talking- and then, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah. And then the, the last one is there is a subset of people where and this tends to be people that are have more years of experience where they can't get the job that they want unless they have that MBA. They just need to get over the hump. And in that case, you just go to whatever it is, whether it's part-time, full-time, or an executive program that just ticks off that last box. And you know you can translate that into the job you want. I have to say, uh, I, I basically found... I had a friend of mine and she got an executive MBA from a well-known school, but not a, let's say a top 10 school. And, but her company paid for the entire thing. And I said, before she did, I said, see if you can get into the best school and ask them if they'll pay part of it. So whatever, if they were gonna give you 25,000 a year, then you pay the rest because frankly, you going to a Duke, a Wharton, a Harvard, any of those schools, the contacts that you make and the companies that are recruiting you make all the difference in the world. You'll make up whatever that money was that you sp uh, had to put out of pocket. You'll make it up in a variety of different ways. And I, That's right. I, I, but I think the advice was very sound. And that is, you know, maybe if you're working for Campbell Soup, having an MBA from a regional school and to, to help you move up will be acceptable. So we're uh, almost out of time here. And I want to ask you this one question. You write about cultivating your image. How do you do that in an authentic way? Well, um, yeah, thanks for that. What I tell people is um, when, when they decide to hire you, when they decide for your promotion, when they decide for your raise, what's your bonus, whether you have any equity, you are not in the room. Mm -hmm. What is in the room is your image. And so what you want to do is you want to spend the time giving people the phrases. So just when you think about marketing and branding, what are the two or three words you want to brand about yourself and go and you want to give people the language so they can share that with others? Well, Ted, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with all of us today. I hope people will be getting uh, your book. You don't have the book in front of you, do you? Here we go. Beautiful cover, well worth yes, reading. Right. Good for you if you're looking for the next job or changing your career. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Everybody have a safe rest of your weekend. Take care. Thank you so much.